The Wood Whisperer is brought to you by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Let's move on to the cross members. Both cross members can be cut from a single board. And fortunately, this one can be milled without all the precautions that we had to take in our previous milling sessions. I joint the face and one edge, and then rip the board at the table saw. After a rip of this length, there's usually a little bowing to deal with. Fortunately, my boards are plenty wide, so it's back to the joiner to straighten the pieces out before trimming them to final width, thickness, and length. So now I've got my cross members milled up and ready to go. The thing that I need to do at this point is add the mortises on the end for the domino construction. The way you do that, very easy. We already have our lines on our template. I just need to transfer those lines to the ends of the workpiece. So as long as my lines are you know, roughly centered, you could certainly uh, move them one way or the other if you wanted to, but I think centered will look the best. Just transfer those lines down. So now I just want to extend those lines. Now we're ready for the dominoes. Now my next step is to add a nice heavy round over to each one of the edges and that'll sort of give it just more of a sculpted smooth look that goes with the rest of the piece. Now the cross members are going to need a little bit of work. I've got a ridge here from the router bit. I've got a little bit of extra material at the ends that I just wasn't quite comfortable enough to go right to the very end. So a block plane and some sanding should take care of them. Now this is not a huge deal, but I did want to show it to you. There's a, a little trace of a knot there and I want to make sure that I fill that. I'll probably have this part facing the bottom so you never really see it, but still, I like to fill it if I can. And I'll just get a little bit of CA glue. A spritz of quick set activator. There you go. Well, now that we have most of the parts done here, there's no reason why we can't do a dry assembly and just kind of get an idea of, you know, just to make sure everything looks the way it's supposed to look. It's cut to the length it's supposed to be cut. You know, this is the time when you're going to see something like maybe a rail, you know, is too thick. Maybe it's too thin and you need to make another one. Um, the curves in my legs still need work. I already knew that, but it's something that becomes a little bit more painfully obvious at this stage when I take a look at it in this form. But for the most part, I gotta say I'm pretty happy with the proportions. I like where my rails are, and I think we're just gonna proceed at this point. So I'm gonna disassemble everything. I'm gonna take these legs back to the bench, you know, sit in my stool, throw on some music, relax a little bit, and just uh, sand the rest of the day away because it's, you really wanna take your time with it. You don't wanna rush that part of the process and you'll be rewarded with a much more fluid, smooth look when it's all said and done. So this leg here is pretty much got all the sanding it's gonna get at this point. And you could really see what I'm going for is just absolute smooth transitions. All those roundovers, you know, for most of our work, that's usually enough. If we're looking for a good rounded over look, just hit it with a little bit of sandpaper and you're done. This is a little bit different. We don't wanna see any transition at all from the, uh, what was it, like a three quarter or one inch round over to the flat surface. We wanna make sure that it's absolutely smooth and soft all the way through. So what I usually wind up doing, I'll hit the flat surfaces with my random orbit sander, but at this point, I don't usually go beyond that. The random orbit sander, especially on these tight curves, 
can create a lot of divots and things. So resist the urge to do that. You got to do it the slow way. Go by hand, uh, fold over a sheet of 180 grit sandpaper, and you're just going to go through and hit all of those edges. Smooth it out. Then what I recommend doing is, you know, once you're at the point that you think you're done, Turn it around, look at it from various different directions, look at it under different lights. A lot of times the way the shadow is cast will reveal problems. So if you're in a particular spot and you don't move, you'll only see that one particular shadow line. So it's really important to take this, maybe even take it in the house and look at it under a different lighting and see if you could figure out what ways will make it look that much better. But like I said, I'm at pretty much at the point that I think I'm good with this. Now, I do wanna mention one thing. Um, You've got an issue here where we have long vertical grain and then horizontal grain. It's a cross grain situation. That can bring up some problems with sanding, right? Because as you're sanding the vertical piece, it's only natural that you're gonna wind up hitting that horizontal piece and we do need this transition to be perfectly smooth. And let me show you up close how I handle that. So I usually start by sanding this vertical piece and my fingers on the bottom, I lift them up a little bit because I don't really wanna put a whole lot of pressure I do want to make contact, I just don't want to be real aggressive down there. So most of the aggressive sanding is being done with my top two fingers. And same thing when you're rounding over these edges. You have to cross the transition line in order for it to be smooth. Okay, once I'm at the point that I think that I've sanded enough, then I'll come back and I'll sand with the grain of the bottom piece right at my borderline. And a couple of passes like this, typically, especially at 180, 220 grit, it's really all you need to cancel out the vertical lines we may have just put in there. And around the corners here, just wrap the corner, roll it around the corner like this. And that should do the trick. Now, another thing you will probably start wondering what you're gonna do about all this end grain. As this curve you know, slopes upwards, we expose end grain right in this area. And as we know, end grain is a lot harder to sand than uh, regular face grain. So what do you do here? Unfortunately, it's just elbow grease. Again, don't be tempted to use something like a power sander because you will divot this beyond repair. You wanna make sure that you take your time, and try to get rid of as much of the white marks as possible. Now on a piece like this, this is gonna test your patience. So I recommend doing as much as you can until you can't stand no more. Once you're at that point, go ahead and hit it with a little bit of water. And I'll show you what happens. This is actually very forgiving. Okay, and I've sanded it enough that once finish goes on, it's gonna look pretty darn flawless, right? So I wouldn't worry about it too much. You definitely wanna have it sanded consistently and any major scratches need to be removed. But if it's not absolutely dead on, 100% perfect, it probably isn't gonna matter all that much, as you can see. And just test it with water. A Little bit of water won't hurt anything. Raise the grain a little bit, but it'll show you if you have any problem areas. Hey Tim, it's Mark. Mark Spagnolo. Mark Spagnolo from the Wood Whisperer. T H E. Okay, you got it. Look, I need a roundover bit fast. I need one right now. No, I've already got those. I got regular roundover bits. This is a special roundover bit. It's different than the other ones. With the little thing that goes with the little floop thing. Yeah, I need. No, I need one of those now. Right now. Thanks, Tim. Eagle America, fast shipping. So what I ordered was a tabletop edge bit. And the idea is it's sort of an extended thumbnail profile where it's not so uh, sharp of a downturn. Here's a regular round over bit of a comparable size and you can see how dramatically different that curvature is between these two bits. So to me, this is much more pleasing for a really thick tabletop. This starts to look a little, I don't know, commercial to me if it's got a big old bull nose round over like this. Something like this is a little bit more elegant. It kind of uh, thins out the top a little bit without going too far and gives you a nice soft curve that you could put your wrists up against, which is perfect for a desk.
So I took a close look at the roundover that we created here and I really like what it does to the surface. So it got me to thinking, is there anywhere else that I've already done a roundover that I might be able to use that bit to improve on it? So let me show you what I did with the cross members here. Now you can see this top piece has had the additional routing done that created this extra edge here and the bottom is the old version. And you can see essentially what I'm doing is removing some of this material right here to help soften that curve a little bit more, which is what this is all about. So it's not perfect. It's going to need a little bit of sanding to further smooth this, but you can see it just makes a, a nice, more flowing curve that I, I think is just a better look and matches the look of the piece uh, when compared to the original, just with a standard roundover. Now, although I'm not too worried about cable management and things like that with this particular project, I do want to make sure that the cords and things that have to go back down uh, from the top of the table down to the PC will have a place to go because I really do want this thing to be right up against the wall. So I need to have some uh, areas in the back of the table that will allow those cords to go through. This plexiglass template that I got from Rockler uh, has come in handy so many times for various different things and having perfect circles and you know these elongated circles like this just comes in really handy for projects so uh, i do recommend picking something like this up and you could see what i've done here is set this one up just at the point that i'm giving myself maybe a four four and a half inch area where the cords are going to be able to go through so i've got a double stick tape to the surface i've got my pattern bit ready to go i'm just going to take a few passes to slowly remove the material until i uh, get my bearing up against the plexiglass template Now I'm going to start thinking about how we're going to attach the top to our leg assemblies here. Now because this is a big fat solid top, it's going to move over the course of the seasons. In Arizona, I don't really have that much movement to be concerned about, but there still is some. So we need to make sure that whatever we do allows this table to expand and contract. So the easiest way that I know to do that is to have some countersunk holes and a screw that's able to move a little bit forward and back. And the cumulative effect of three screws moving forward and back is to give it about you know, a half inch, even more, depending on how much of a slot you create uh, to allow it to expand and contract and just move around. So let me show you how I make it. Most of the work is gonna be done in the top of the leg assembly here. So I'm just gonna use a countersink bit to put two holes here in the long part of the uh, top assembly. And we'll have one in the back. Okay. Now this bit is gonna allow me to punch all the way through. And it's sized so it's a little bit bigger than my screw. Now once I know I'm all the way through, uh, and mind you, this is a quick and dirty way of doing it, but it does work just fine. I'm gonna sort of angle my bit back and forth to widen that slot. The one thing I'm being very careful of is to make sure that my bit doesn't contact this outside rim of the countersink. Because if I do, I'm gonna wind up ruining the integrity of that and we need that to be a perfect circle. You'll see why in a bit. Now with the piece flipped over, I'm essentially going to do the same thing from the top end. Just being careful not to go too far. You can see I'm creating an elongated slot. Now the end result should be a slot that allows the screw to move quite a bit back and forth. Now of course these holes don't look very good so we're going to need to plug them up the best way to do that is to make your own plugs using the same exact species of wood. So let me show you how I make that. What I've got here is called a tapered plug cutter. And it's something that you really only want to use with a drill press. 
and it's going to create a slightly tapered plug that's going to be perfect. So you have to use the material that you made your project out of, and you can make these custom plugs for anything. So let's go ahead and, uh, well, we got to make six of them. I've got this guy clamped in place here, so got to adjust the clamp each and every time, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Now a quick cut at the bandsaw will release the plugs. A little bit of glue, a couple taps with a mallet, and that will sit in there perfectly. Just make sure you align the grain and you should be fine. Now before I start to do any sort of assembly on this piece, I want to make sure that I get some finish on this surface. And this way I could screw it to the top, flip everything over, and start doing the final processing of the whole piece and keep these legs attached. Okay, the bottom already has finish, so why not have this surface with a couple coats of finish on it? So, nothing tricky. It doesn't have to be super neat. Just want to make sure it's nice and sealed up. Now before we attach the legs to the top, we need to connect the cross members and glue them in place. We've got all of our dominoes here ready to go. I've got some epoxy, which is my glue of choice on this project, and it gives me a lot of working time. Just going to take some of this epoxy and carefully put it into the mortises. I don't want to be too messy here because this will get epoxy on the leg and it's going to be visible later. So I want to be a little bit careful about how I apply it. We want a good wet coat inside of those mortises. Of course, we need to get epoxy inside the mortise on the cross member. Okay, paint some epoxy on the domino itself. Now push against that side for me. Just so what do you do if you don't have clamps this long? Well, you could always join a couple clamps together and have them link up. It's one option. Uh, and for long clamps, there really is no cheaper solution than a good old pipe clamp. Okay, it's looking pretty good. Let that dry for a few hours. Now while the base glue up is drying, it's a good time to attach it to the tabletop. Everything is here, why not? So I gotta start by pre-drilling a little bit of a pilot hole for the screw. Now I've just added a clamp here to hold everything in place for me. I don't have to worry about it moving around. A little bit of uh, lubrication for our screw here. And I will attach it by hand. I like doing this by hand when I go into a solid wood top because it just gives me a, a feel for if I'm going into, you know, a dangerous area that could crack the top. If you use something with power, you tend to lose control a little bit easier and you might go too far and you could crack it. By hand, at least you know when things are really starting to tighten up. Now we can plug these guys up. So I've got my plugs ready to go. Just need a little bit of glue in the hole there. Some glue on the plug itself and tap it as far as it'll go. This isn't structural, it's just for surface appearance, so you don't really need to tap that in any further than it wants to go. And once the glue is dry on the plugs, I just use a flush trim saw. I'm 
just a little bit of sanding to clean it up. Not bad at all. Now the epoxy's dried for a few hours and I feel pretty confident clamps are removed. I don't think we're gonna have any problems at this point. So the last thing that I wanna do is just do some final finessing of the curves using an abrasive pad. This is the lowest grit that I could find. It's 500, so that's still pretty high. But what I like is the fact that it's really padded and I can go around all of these edges and really soften them up nicely. Uh, the 500 grit, I'm not really trying to sand the grain to 500 necessarily. I just want something that cushions uh, the pressure of my fingers and helps me round over those corners. So uh, we're just putting a clear finish on this. The fact that I'm sanding it to 500, normally you guys know I usually stop at 180. But in this case, uh, the effect that I get by blending very softly using something like this is really good. So um, I break my own rule <laughs> of sanding to a really high grit on this particular type of project. So I've already done that. I've gone through, looked at all the critical parts that I thought needed a little bit of touch up. And at this point, I am so anxious to flip this thing over and see what it looks like because I actually haven't seen it together yet. Uh, but the problem is, when am I going to have another opportunity? Well, first of all, it takes a lot of effort to get Nicole in here to help me flip this. <laughs> and, uh, and I really don't want to have her help me get it back on the table. So I'm resisting temptation. I'm going to start to finish the base as it is now, because when am I going to have complete open access to the base like this after this point? If I flip it and put it on the ground, the top is going to create a huge shadow and it's actually going to be more difficult to finish, especially since I've got an area of unfinished wood next to an area that's already got finish on it. So I'm just going to hold out. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave town for a couple days. I'm going to woodworking in America and I'll be gone for three or four days. So mentally, I mean, I'm glad I'm going to the conference. I'm just mentally don't like the idea of separating from this project at such a crucial moment uh, right before what I would consider like the big reveal. So I'm just going to suck it up and finish it anyway. So let me grab my polyurethane and we'll get started. Now, basically, this is my standard wiping varnish procedure. If you don't already know about it, I do have a DVD on this topic called A Simple Varnish Finish. And the idea is to just give you every possible detail you could need to successfully create a good varnish finish every single time using the wiping method. Seems like it should be simple and straightforward, and in some regards it is, but there are details that you need to know to be successful at this. Once you know them, it's fairly easy, but uh, you need somebody to give you a few tips and tricks here and there. So that's what that DVD is all about. You can get that in the Wood Whisperer store. this side it's be a little bit messy but just got to get the finish on there and do what you got to do try and stay as clean as possible but to get down in that corner there got to get it messy come back with the clean cloth that excess. Now, as you can see, the table is flipped over and on the ground in the right orientation. And uh, it wasn't that difficult. It just took me, Nicole, and uh, about 15 curse words coming out of Nicole's mouth to get it on the floor. But uh, this was definitely a two-person job to move this thing. Now, I didn't show you all of the steps for finishing the base because it's going to be repetitive. It's a lot easier, especially on camera, to show how I finish this top. Uh, but just know that I put about four coats of finish on the base. The base itself isn't going to get a whole lot of wear and tear, so four coats of a wiping varnish is pretty good. I may go with a little bit more on the top because that's where our arms, hands, uh, you know, uh, cups, plates, things like that are going to touch the surface. It's going to get worn, so it's good to have a nice, durable, thick film finish. So, of course, this process starts very similar to what we did with the base. I'm going to start sanding with 80 grit. I like to mark it up with my pencil. And we'll progress from 80 to 120 and finally to 180 and we can start applying our finish.
Now my rounded edges, I'm gonna start by sanding with 180. And the router bit left a nice clean edge here, so it just needs a little bit of touch up. On the curves on the end here, I'm actually gonna try and sand with the grain with the 180. And because the end grain likes to darken up when it absorbs finish, I'm gonna hit it with the 220 as well. Sanding to a finer grit will sort of help even out that absorption, at least to some extent. Now with well over a hundred videos here at the Wood Whisperer, I sometimes take it for granted that some of these, uh, you know, basic safety things have been covered and I assume that you've seen some of the earlier episodes where we've covered things like dust collection safety. Sanding a tabletop like this is going to take some time. Even though I'm using a really high quality dust extraction system with my sander, I'm still going to protect myself. I'm going to use a 3M respirator. This is, I believe it's a 3M7500. I've got it outfitted with uh, some nice lightweight filters here. These little, I mean, they're goofy looking because they're pink, but you know, since when have I uh, been afraid of looking goofy? It's the 3M7500. In fact, mine is the large size, 7503, because I've got a big mouth. The thing that I like about this is it seals really well right around your face, as opposed to some of the standard like uh, construction dust masks that you've seen folks wear. They make better ones than the cheap, you know, the ones that start to irritate your face really quickly. They do have higher quality level ones, but they're nothing like a good quality respirator. And I'm out here almost every day for hours at a time. I wanna be doing this thing when I'm an old man and just, you know, crawling in here with my coffee at 80 years old. Uh, I wanna still be doing this stuff and be able to breathe at that time. So with that much exposure, it's not overkill as far as I'm concerned to wear this every day. You watch my live shop cam on the website, any given time you watch it, most likely I'm gonna be wearing this, you know, goofy pink respirator. So, um, so I do recommend you have a good dust extraction system. And even though you have that, it doesn't mean that everything is completely safe. It's still gonna let some dust into the air and there's lots of dust on all these tools. So every time I move around and I shift the air in the room, I kick some of that dust into the air. So it's always a good idea to protect yourself. Now let's talk about the finish for the tabletop and some of the things you may need to be concerned with. First is the pore structure. Mahogany has open pores. So depending on the final look that you want for your piece, you may or may not have to do a pore fill. Now for me personally, this isn't the type of project that I would really worry about that with. I'm not going with a really high gloss surface, which is one case where you would want to do a pore fill. Uh, when you're doing high gloss, any interruption in the surface's sort of continuity will ruin the look. So a high gloss surface on an open poured wood looks very weird. So if you've ever seen it, you know what I'm talking about, but you could see those little pits in the surface and it just looks odd. So that would be one case. Um, you know, the other thing is if you are just trying to build a thick film finish and you know this is a, a surface that's gonna get cleaned a lot, let's say. I know I've had shelves that I've made out of oak that were not pore filled. And then over the years, as you dust them, the dust seems to get packed into the open sort of crevices, lines, and pores in the surface. So it would have been a nice idea to have those filled and then hit with the film finish so that when you dust them, it just you know, slides right off and the dust actually comes off the shelf and not embedded into those cracks. Now, although I'm not gonna do a pour fill on my table, I do wanna show you some of the materials that I would use if that's something I was going to do. First of all, I like using, when possible, an oil-based filler because you get more working time on a surface like this, you kinda need that, right? So what I have here is Bartley's Paste Wood Filler, okay? And it just is a, you know, neutral colored, it actually kinda looks a little bit like latex paint. So the idea is, with this neutral color, you can add dyes to get it to be whatever color you want. What I've got here is a, a dark mission brown, and a trans tint red. Because it's mahogany, and because I know it's eventually going to get to a deep red color, it's probably not a bad idea for me to go for a reddish tinted brown filler that'll look rather natural for this. Now here's the thing, we're putting color in there, right? So if we apply that to the raw wood, what's gonna happen? Well, it's gonna stain the background as well. So depending on whether or not you want that to happen, will tell you whether or not you should seal the wood prior to adding the filler. If you seal the wood, we would use like a de-waxed shellac over the surface. That seals off all the fibers. Then you could put your filler on top, scrape the excess away, and sand it back down. Now you're not gonna sand down really to bare wood. You're trying to just sand back to that shellac layer. What winds up happening is all the color stays on the surface. It doesn't absorb into the wood. So when you sand it back, all you have left is the filler with the color inside the pores, and the background of the wood 
you know, the main surface of the wood still looks, you know, raw. It still looks pretty plain. And then you could top coat it with your finish. So like I said, I'm not going to use this method, but I wanted to make sure you were aware that this is one, uh, what I consider one of the best ways to do a pore fill. Another thing we need to talk about is color. Now, if you tell someone you're building them a mahogany table, the average person is going to expect a table that is a dark, deep, reddish burgundy color, right? It's just what we know of as uh, mahogany furniture. Well, the thing is, raw mahogany, freshly finished mahogany, looks like this. It's like a salmon-y, you know, light brown color and nothing like what someone might expect. So if you're doing this for someone else, you may have no choice but to use a dye or a stain and accelerate the color change and bring it to that dark, beautiful red burgundy color. Now this is for me, and I know what Mother Nature is gonna do to this table. I'm in no rush to see it get there. You know, it'll, it'll get there when it gets there. I'm not too worried about it. And in fact, let me show you what Mother Nature does to mahogany. This is a David Marks bar stool that I made years ago. It's made out of mahogany. Uh, it's actually a mixture because I, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. So it's a mixture of Honduran and African mahogany, but the top is primarily Honduran mahogany. Look at that color difference. No stain, no dye, mother nature, that's all. So with a couple years of UV and oxidizing and just, you know, whatever it takes to make this color shift occur, boom, look at that. So I'm patient. I'll let this happen naturally. I'm not too worried about it. You'll also notice that the, if there's a little bit of color variation, which I do have in my base, I'll show that to you later, but because we use pieces from different boards, sometimes one's a little lighter than the other, that tends to even out over time. So if you're patient and you're more of, a, I guess I might call myself somewhat of a naturalist. I don't really like to use stain if I could avoid it. I want, you know, I want to see knots. I want to see imperfections. I want it to look like wood. I mean, honestly, if I didn't want it to look like wood, I would have built this thing out of plastic or metal, or I would have just gone to Walmart and bought a desk. Uh, I'm making it out of wood. I want it to look like wood, and I want to celebrate the beauty that nature provides us with, and part of that beauty is imperfections. So you'll notice I do have some stuff on the surface that someone else might avoid. Personal preference is what it comes down to. Now, the finish strategy I'm going to use here is going to be very similar to what I cover in my DVD, a simple varnish finish. But I am going to do something a little bit different at the beginning, and you can do this on just about any project. The first coat of finish that you apply to the surface is your sealer coat, whatever it is, whether it's varnish, lacquer, shellac, anything, that first coat is what you would consider your sealer. So if I use an oil finish as that first sealer coat, I still have to wait, you know, four to six hours for that coat to dry before I can add another coat to it. Well, what if I could use something as a sealer coat that dries very quickly? So de-wax shellac is perfect for that. It'll dry within an hour, and then I'm on to my second coat of finish, which would be, you know, I'd switch to varnish at that point, and basically I cut about six hours out of my finishing schedule. So what I have here is a one-pound cut of de-waxed shellac. I'm just going to brush it onto the surface. The wood is really thirsty at this point, so it's going to suck it right in, and then within about an hour, it'll be dry, and I could lightly sand and start using my varnish on the surface. So let's go ahead and start applying the shellac. Now I normally apply shellac with a rag, just for simplicity, but uh, in this case I've got a lot of real estate to cover here, and I find that a brush just allows me to move a little bit faster and cleaner as well. And I keep a paper towel close by in case I get any crazy drips. With a one pound cut, it's pretty thin, so drips are going to happen. And now I can start with my coats of varnish. Notice I've got my cotton pad nice and thick so that it cushions your finger pressure and I have my varnish in a secondary container. Normally I like a, a bit of a wider container than this so I don't have to bend my pad to soak up the material, but that's all I have right now. I'm just going for a nice, even, light coat.
Now that first varnish coat is completely dry and you should feel some uh, bumps and you know sort of grit in the surface. Perfectly normal, it's just the way things go. So of course we need to sand the surface down. I'm going to use 320. You could certainly go with a 400 grit or something at this point. I wouldn't go less than 320 though. We are sanding finish and not wood. So a nice sanding block like this does a real fine job. I'm not really trying to sand away much finish. What I'm trying to do is just smooth things out. So once it's smooth to the touch, you can move on. Now to get rid of all the dust that we put on the surface, I'm going to use a dampened rag. And it's really only dampened with water. Uh, you can use mineral spirits for something like this, but I just don't think it's necessary. And if I can avoid using a chemical, uh, why not? So water and a paper towel works just fine. And just keep using a different part of the paper towel so you don't continue to spread this paste that you're going to create once the, uh, the dust gets hit with a little bit of liquid. And this rag, by the way, is damp. It's not soaked. I'm not leaving a lot of uh, moisture on the surface. It's just a dampened rag. And as a bit of a precautionary measure, I'm going to use a standard paint filter here and filter some of my finish. It's just the satin armor seal. And now that we're building coats of finish, there should be a lot less friction on the surface to deal with, so this should go a little bit faster than that first coat did. And it should spread further as well. A lot of instructions, especially you know, on this wiping varnish, will recommend that you put a coat on, you know, flood it on and wipe off the excess. That's so wasteful. And the reason I developed this method of just kind of wiping on and leaving it on is because you build a finish faster, almost like brushing. But instead of brushing, you're actually using the rag as a nice flat and smooth applicator pad. So I also find that you can end up with a lot of streaks if you wind up uh, wiping too much material off because you tend to have areas where it's a little heavier than others and it gets streaky. And one way to fix the streaks is to apply more finish to the surface. So why not just apply a good amount of finish, build your coats faster, and be done sooner. It's a heck of a lot less wasteful. Now that second coat of varnish is dry and it's ready for another light sanding. From here on out, this process is pretty repetitive. Depending on how thick of a film you want, you could do this for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine coats, however many you want to do. I probably got about two more coats on this before I call it finished. So I'm going to start sanding and just keep in mind, sanding between each coat, wipe the dust off, and then add another layer until you're satisfied with the finish build. Well folks, here it is, the trestle table in its final location. And I've even got a couple computer components here just so you can see what it's gonna look like. Uh, probably I'll spend the last uh, part of the afternoon here attaching maybe a uh, power strip or something at the very back. Maybe I'll just screw it into the top of the piece. And you know, there's minimal wiring here for these computer setups. So I'm not too worried about that, but I think what I may wind up doing is running channel uh, material, the plastic channel stuff, and you could just paint it the uh, color of the wall, uh, run that down. I've already got one there for uh, the internet connection, so I may as well just get a slightly wider one and put a few more cords and things in there, and that should completely hide the wires. Uh, but you know, at this stage in a project, you have to ask yourself, did you meet your goals? Did you meet your goals for the way it looks? you know, for the functionality. So let's uh, address a few of those things. First of all, I've got the depth that I was looking for. Now my monitors are further away, so it's a much more comfortable viewing distance. Um, looking at the base, you may think that those cross members could cause a problem, you know, hitting your knees. But the reality is, because of that angle and because of how far the top sits out, that's not a problem at all. I am nowhere near these cross members. So um, mission accomplished there. The overall shape of the thing, you know, the, the, just the visual effect of it. Is it what I was going for? Is it what I was thinking of when I was first drawing this on a piece of paper? And I have to say, yes, absolutely. 
I would have liked to have done a second prototype just to confirm this because I, I did kind of take a leap of faith after doing the first prototype. I thought, okay, well, let's just jump right into it because I don't have enough time. We lucked out. You know, sometimes you can get bit in the butt when you do that type of thing. But I think we, uh, I got the shape that I was really looking for, the softness of the curve, the way everything is blended together, the relative size of the parts. And, you know, for a table that's this substantial, it doesn't look that heavy to me. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's done in a way that it looks graceful. And for a 92 inch long tabletop, I don't think that's very easy to do. So I think we may have a, a little bit of uh, educated guesses there and maybe a little luck. So uh, the one last thing I will mention, the finish here, I've got about four coats. I ended up with five, yeah, four or five coats of the uh, wiping varnish. Now I gave this already about four days to cure before I put anything on it. I just don't like to take any chances with that. Even still, I'm gonna probably wait another week or two and I'll come back and I'll hit the surface with a little bit of 4000 grit. The 4000 grit I have is in the shape of uh, you know, those uh, little padded things for a random orbit sander. I just use those by hand and I'll wipe it down and just kind of get any of that little surface grit that might be left on the surface and smooth it out. The 4000 grit isn't enough to really change this sheen because I'm already working with a satin so 4000 grit on this surface isn't really going to make any visual effect. It's only going to smooth it out to the touch and just wipe away any dust that uh, comes up from that. And you'll be good to go. So I hope you enjoyed this little journey into building a trestle table. Not your average trestle table, but you get the idea. And um, well, I guess I'll see you on the next project. Thanks for watching.